evening and welcome to our service at Christ Church Woodley. We also welcome our Zoom watchers and those who will be accessing this service later in the week on YouTube. I um, have to say, don't have to say, I'm delighted to say, even though I missed it, everybody who contributed to the concert last night, apparently it was a great success. And um, I think sure Brenda and Steve want to thank everybody. Um, there's no total at the moment, but you'll find out soon. This morning, tea and coffee will be served, and uh, it's just outside the door, so if you're new to us today, so I forgot to say if anybody is new, welcome. So join us for tea and coffee and uh, get to know us. Um, we ask the Lord's blessing on the work of the church today and in the coming week, all the activities. Um, our prayer is peace in the world and peace in our hearts. And now it's my real pleasure to welcome our own Reverend Jackie Case. We're looking forward to your message, Jackie. Good morning. It's nice to be here with you again. Let's continue. Uh, I'm not going to call it a prayer. I think I'm going to call it a reflection. This is the church of my dreams, the church of the warm heart, of the open mind, of the adventurous spirit, the church that cares, that heals hurt lives, that comforts old people, that challenges youth, that knows no division of culture or class, no frontiers, geographical or social. The church that inquires as well as, as affirms, that looks forward as well as back the church of the master, the church of the people, high as the ideals of Jesus, low as the humblest human, a working church, a worshipping church, a winsome church, a church that interprets truth in terms that inspires courage for this life and hope for the life to come. A church of courage, a church of all good people, the church of the living God. I think I've probably set the bar quite high this morning <laughs> with that. You might be interested to know that this is anonymous. No idea who wrote it or when. But it really is a tremendous challenge to aim at. So we're going to sing now our opening hymn, which is Singing the Faith, number 409. 409. Let us build a house.
Please be seated. Let us pray. Praise the Lord, all flowers and trees. Sing his praises, wasps and bees, lilies white and red, red roses. Show your thanks in groups and poses. Skip and hop, you little rabbits. Make his praise your daily habit. Worship him, you clouds and fogs. Wag your tails, you happy dogs. Dig for joy all moles and worms, and worship him in happy terms. Praise the Lord, O night and day, the moon's pale light and sun's bright ray. Shout his praises, old and young. Keep thanks and praises on your tongue. Lift up your voices, large and small. Sing praise to him who made us all. Gracious God, we offer you praise and thanks. We come into your presence this morning, rejoicing in all that you have given us, in all that you have done for us. Help us now to settle, to relax into your presence, to spend quality time with you. You, the loving one who made us, who yearned over each of us in the womb, who cherished us as babies, who tended us as children, who gave us glimpses of glory from our prams, who moulded us, inciting cries for justice, the one whose loving arm is still always under our head. O oh Lord our God, you say to us, have no fear. For I have redeemed you. I call you by name, and you are mine. You are loved by God. And so for a moment let us keep silent in that thought. Be with us this morning, gracious and holy God. Enable us to see ourselves as we really are. And as we approach you in honesty and truth, we know that there are so many ways that we fall short of the standard that you lovingly set. And yet, Lord God, we know that you love us. We know that you long for deep and truthful relationship with us. Forgive us our sins. And enable us to grow more like you, our loving and gracious parent, every day. Amen. Here's a little story. No one could see what Fred saw in that old house. They saw brokenness. He saw potential. They saw chipped paint falling gutters, and a leaky roof. 
not to mention dirt everywhere and enough cobwebs to support an ant farm. <coughs> he saw the builder's original intent and what that house could one day be. Other people couldn't understand why Fred worked hour after hour, nailing in broken pieces, sanding down the chip paint. His hands often got splinters or ached from his labours, but he didn't stop. He spent lots of money, but he didn't care. He saw not what was, but what would be. And that house, in his mind's eye and in his heart, had been made to shine. You see, Fred knew something that others didn't. He knew what the house had been built to be, because he had built it. A terrible disaster, one of those freak natural storms, had destroyed the house many years back. But Fred would not give up on that old, beloved house. It took years. One could even say it took a lifetime. But one day, other people saw it too. No one could recognize in the elegant mansion that once forsaken home. I'll leave you to ponder on the meaning of that story. Now it's time for our junior church prayer and Junior church lessons. So, who influences us and what influence should we be on others? Let us pray. God in my everything. God be in my whole life. God guide me and be my influence. God be in my thoughts and my imagination. God be in my yes and in my no. God be in my today and tomorrow. God be in my decisions and opportunities. God be in my words and actions. God be in my everything. Amen. We've chosen the hymn, My God is So Big. The words will be on the screen. Please join in the actions.
Now we're going to have our two lectionary readings. The first is from the letter of James. The second is from Mark's Gospel. So the first reading is from the James chapter 5 and beginning to read at verse 13 and can be found on page 1216 in the church bibles the prayer of faith is any one of you in trouble he should pray is anyone happy let him sing songs of praise is any one of you sick he should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Oh. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. The second reading is from Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 50. Whoever is not against us is for us. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter the life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where fire never goes out and if your foot causes you to sin cut it off it is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell and if your eye causes you to sin pluck it out it is better for you to enter the kingdom of god with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worms does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Amen. A few weeks ago, I spent a morning tidying up the plant pots that have been languishing all over one side of our garden. They've been there for two summers now since we moved in in May 2022. Some were empty or filled with other garden junk, 
Some were full of stagnant rainwater, breeding goodness knows what flying insects for next year. Some were filled with soil and a crop of grass and weeds, but a few still contained viable growing plants, mostly hanging on for dear life, awaiting rescue. So I planted up six large containers with rescued plants and some cheap pansies. I'd bought a week before, and I also had enough for two hanging baskets with some straggly geraniums and trailing fuchsias I'd bought some time ago with good intentions but done nothing with. I was quite pleased with the effects, and I still, to some extent, am. Some of the rescued plants are virtually sighing with relief in their new environment. However, all is not well in at least one of the pots, where I stupidly decided to reuse the old soil. And on one side of this pot, a large number of mushroom-type growths have pushed up about one-third of the topsoil and are thriving alongside the two rescued climbers and the three pansy plants. So far, the plants don't seem affected, but I'm watching closely and will probably repot it if there are signs of distress in my intended plant. What do you do about interlock? How do you keep your planted community safe and healthy? How do you care for those whose survival is challenged by circumstances outside their control and outside yours? And isn't that really something? of what this morning's lectionary passages are about. How to keep the faith community healthy. Alternatively, we could look at it another way and say, what does a healthy Christian community look like? The James passage focuses on how we should respond to the ups and downs of life, both personally and as a community of faith. The Mark passage shows Jesus challenging his disciples' assumptions about who's in and who's out of the discipleship community, and he's setting a standard of responsibility towards one another that is eye-wateringly tough. So let's look at some of the contributing factors then for Christian community health, which arise from those passages. And then I'll leave you to measure yourselves and our church community here against them. There are three things I want us to consider. First of all, accepting those of another flock. And that's a paraphrase of something that Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 16. I have sheep of another flock, he said. And then secondly, I want to look very briefly about our ministry responsibilities to our own. And thirdly, remaining faithful to the gospel. If we can do those, we're on the way to being a healthy Christian community. So first of all, then, accepting those of another flock. Jesus' disciples had given up a lot to follow him round the countryside. They'd been challenged in so many ways. 
physical, mental, and spiritual. And they'd suffered hardship, hostility, confusion. And yet here they are, still with him, loyally supporting him, even when he's so often pretty tough on them. They belong to him, body and soul, and he belongs to them. Or so they think. So it's no wonder then that they are bristling at someone who isn't one of their number performing miracles in Jesus' name, doing things that they wouldn't or maybe couldn't do. He's got to be stopped. He has no credentials and no right to use Jesus' name like this. And yet Jesus virtually brushes off their legitimate concern. If he's doing things in my name, he can hardly speak ill of me, can he? Is Jesus' reaction. There are more important things to worry about, is the subtext of what he's saying. More important things to worry about than someone who seems to be doing good things and won't oppose or obstruct my ministry. Maybe this person, whoever he is, will become known to them in the future and will add a new dynamic to their later work. That's in God's hand. In Jesus' day, he's not one of us was a very familiar stance, as, if we're honest, it is today. It was part of the reason, maybe, that Jesus was largely rejected by the Pharisees and the scribes. He wasn't one of their group. He hadn't been through a similar training and discipline to theirs. And therefore, what possible insights could he have that would contribute to their knowledge and understanding of God? And so here, Jesus catches his disciples doing the self-same thing. And of course, we do this today. We work more together as Christian denominations, that's very clear, especially on social issues. But some of us are still uneasy about one another's differing interpretations and practices. We still tend to have the mindset, my way is the right way. And yet new ideas, New understandings are stimulating and faith-building. Just considering a new and different viewpoint, even if in the end we don't accept it, causes us to grow in faith and in maturity. It's spiritual exercise. So those of another flock, whether we know their credentials, or not, may well be able to offer us something valuable and useful. And Jesus, of course, is nothing but inclusive in his attitude. Now, the second thing to consider is this idea of how we minister to our own. It's a very sensible rule of life to take good care of what you already have. I'd probably have much better looking hanging baskets if I'd taken good care of the plants that I bought so long ago instead of just leaving them to languish in the garden. And that's equally true of the Christian community. Much as we see our mission as spreading the gospel beyond those who already have heard and accepted it, we have a duty of care for all God's children, those new to the faith, but also those whose lives have been spent in service to the kingdom. You might have been surprised that James's final remarks emphasized the care of the sick and the frail within the Christian community. Surely that goes without saying. We have a well-developed tradition 
of pastoral care in this church. But the early church, like many task-driven groups, had to struggle with the tension between the urgency of serving the spread of the gospel and caring spiritually and practically for those who were becoming less able to contribute actively to that mission effort. Don't forget that in James's day, his Christian people that he's talking to believed that the end would come within at least a few generations. And therefore, there was a heightened sense of urgency to get the message out to as many people as possible, literally to save souls in the short time that was left. Socially, sickness and incapacity has always been a threat to the identity and the stability of any community. The aftermath of the COVID pandemic is still with us. It has changed the way that we do some things. It's damaged the education and the confidence of a generation of children. Um, I'm uh, involved in the management committee of a uh, youth counselling service. Um, and the numbers of children who are referred for counselling due to anxiety has shot up since COVID. And then, of course, there are the social issues that are raised by people missing out on those formative experiences from mixing together with others. Some people are still somewhat nervous of crowded places, public transport, and things like that. And when sickness strikes, there is a temptation for the community to isolate and marginalize the sick. That's the survival response in any society. And that, of course, is what we did in COVID. We isolated people, quite rightly, to stop the infection from spreading. But it has consequences, particularly for those people who are on the receiving end of those isolation. In Greco-Roman society of New Testament times, a natural social reaction was that the needs of the healthy should prevail. A healthy community advertised the favor of the gods and sickness smacked of the gods' disfavor. Healthy citizens could play their part in prosperity and well-being of society, whereas the sick and the frail were at best a drain on resources and at worst an infectious risk to those contributing the most to social well-being. But the view that James promotes within the Christian community is very different. It is counter-cultural. He highlights the need to pray at all times and in all circumstances, praise in good times, fervent prayer in times of trouble. Well, yes, that's pretty obvious if you come from a faith background. And yet that's all about trust in God and acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and the, infinite, and the intimate relationship that God has with believers. But James also does something else. He empowers the sick to ask for prayer ministry from the community leaders, the elders. Prayer with and for and over the sick may well have been a Jewish custom continued by the early church. And anointing with oil often was seen as a medicinal act in the Greco-Roman world. 
But if you've ever been anointed with oil or anointed someone with oil, you'll know that it is a very powerful, intimate, and gently soothing act. Prayer offered by the righteous, says James, is effective and powerful. Now, he doesn't tackle head-on, though, the concern that God does not always physically heal the sick. He sets that aside. God is sovereign, and God's sovereign will must prevail. And it's not for us to tell God what to do. But asking, asking is a sign of trust and dependence. And there are many kinds of healing, not all physical. How often does a loving, listening ear heal the soul, especially when accompanied by sincere, non judgmental prayer? Now, you might be surprised that I'm talking about non judgmental prayer. Let me tell you a little story. I had a friend who was just beginning a very promising career as a professional double bass player. She would zoom up and down the M40 between Reading and Birmingham, and she had several times played in the orchestra based in Birmingham that was conducted by Simon Rattle. She really was on her way up professionally. And one night, coming home from a concert, she slipped on a wet pavement and broke her wrist in several places. A long series of hospital treatments to to relieve pain, to set bones, then ensued. They even tried setting her bones crooked so that she could continue to play her double bass. But nothing availed. Her professional career was over. She was a Christian, and some well-meaning member of her congregation told her that she clearly didn't have enough faith because if she had prayed hard enough, God would have healed her. That's what I mean about judgmental prayer. It's not like that. We can't tell God what to do. God has other plans for us sometimes, and eventually we have to accept them. She's probably reaching retirement now, but she did become a very effective youth worker. Perhaps that had been God's plan for her all along. But praying with the sick is very important. Those of us who are pastoral visitors, I hope that we pray for those we visit and that we also offer to pray with those we visit. We don't have to second guess God. We don't have to tell God what to do or guess what God is going to do. We simply have to sit with someone in God's presence and help them to be healed by being in God's presence. It's not as difficult as it may seem. So praying with the sick, very important. James says the sick should ask for prayer. And who benefits from that prayer? We all do. Some are comforted and loved back into a vibrant faith. Others are energized to reach out. And the last point I want to make is about remaining faithful to the gospel. There has been in recent months much claiming of divine inspiration and divine intervention. 
by larger-than-life characters strutting to look more. I'm aware that my first point about accepting and learning from viewpoints not like our own may sometimes be dangerous advice. Many, I believe, are being led astray by what the Bible calls false prophets. It was ever thus. So how can we be open to new ideas and open to sheep from another flock, but be kept safe from those who would knowingly or unwittingly lead us astray. It's a dangerous path to walk. I would suggest that the simplest way to do it is to use gospel principles. The gospel narrative gives us principles that should guide us and should aid our discernment. I'm going to give you two guidance verses, and then I'm going to give you no more than three minutes to discuss with somebody sitting close to you, or as near as you can get, another Bible verse that might be helpful. The two I've got are, by their fruit you will know them. That's Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Matthew 5, verse 5. So have a think with your neighbours and see if you can think of any other that might be helpful. And then you might like to share them with other people. Just three minutes, I'm looking at the That's it. Time's up. Do carry on discussing this over coffee. It's really good to be, uh, you know, talking about spiritual things over coffee. Let's uh, sing a hymn at this point. Um, the hymn is hymn number 664. Lord, you call us to your service.
We are each called to serve God in our own way. And so this is an appropriate point for me to bless both the gifts that people have brought, the money that they have donated by direct debit, and also the offerings that people give in terms of time and thought and prayer and commitment. So gracious and holy God, we bring our gifts before you. We ask that you will bless them and bless us and that you will use them in the service of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a response to our prayers of intercession this morning. I shall say, you made us one family. Would you please respond, Lord, show us how to care. You made us one family. Lord, show us how to care. Let us pray. Living Lord, we see your tears in the daily news appealing to us in helpless, hungry, dehydrated children in the bitter anguish of their parents and loved ones. Those which come most closely to mind in the Middle East, in Ukraine, but there are so many other places. And so we hold them before you, trusting in your mercy. Challenge our complacency through those who are unprotected. You made us one family. Lord, show us how to care. You are Christ, the refugee. Escaping violence and injustice, oppression and war, earthquake and famine. Seeking asylum, needing shelter, food and clothing, and challenging us to work for peace and justice. You made us one family. Lord, Show us how to care. You are Christ, the homeless on our street. We pass you by, aware of our guilt, but not knowing what to do. You made us one family. Lord, show us how to care. Christ the prisoner, suffering the humiliation of a prison cell, longing for release, longing for letters and visitors, for words of encouragement and hope, for acceptance and love. You made us one family. Lord, show us how to care. Christ, you come as a stranger, a newcomer to our town and maybe to our church. You come as a visitor from another part of our country or from another part of the world. You challenge our insularity and prejudice, our indifference and apathy, hoping that we will respond with love and respect, welcoming you into our fellowship and with the hospitality of our homes. You made us one family. Lord, show us how to care. Lord Jesus Christ, you are here in our community, in the sick and the housebound, the bereaved, the lonely and depressed. We remember this morning those of our own community who are sick, those who are recovering from operations, those who are awaiting medical treatment. We remember those who are recently bereaved. 
And we pray particularly for Sarah Peters, Lucy and Hannah, following the death of their mum, Jackie. We thank God for all that Jackie did for the life and ministry of this church. We thank you that for her, all the tribulations of life are past. We pray for her family. We ask that you will comfort them, that you will support them, and that you will enable them to give thanks for her and to continue in their own lives. You made us one family. Lord, show us how to care. You are here in our midst, Lord, longing for our time, for our understanding, for our friendship and our love. Continue to be with us in the rest of this day. We pray for the family of little Ezra who's going to be baptised this afternoon. We ask your blessing on all who are going to attend that service. We ask that you will touch hearts, that you will renew in some the grace that they received at their baptism, and that for others you will spark the beginning of a journey towards knowing you better. You made us one family. Lord, show us how to care. We ask all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 407. Hear the call of the king.
Son of the living God, shine upon us with your unfailing grace. Grant us wisdom, the power of faith, and unchanging hope. Amen. Let us bless one another as we say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.